I'm Reverend Charles Butler, and I'm the host of Faith, Finance, and You. I really saw a need for the spiritual and moral development and raising the consciousness of this community. So I was grateful to have the opportunity to have a chance to speak to my brothers and sisters in the community about Faith, Finance, and You. And welcome to Harlem Talk Radio. Dot com, Faith, Finance, and You. I'm Reverend Charles Butler, your host. I thank you all for tuning in and joining us today. We are very pleased to have a good friend of mine and a special guest, Mr. Ryan C. Mack, who's the president of Optimum Capital Management, LLC. He's an educator. He is a teacher. He is one who knows about investments, and so we're going to, he's also an author, and we're going to talk to him and get some information on how he can help us as we look towards what we can do as a community on faith, finance, and you, what we can do as a Harlem community. So I'd like to say welcome, Ryan. Thank you so welcome much for having show. me. All right. I uh, want to just jump right in there with the, the book, the author of a yeah. new book here now, Living in the Village, and can you tell us a little bit of what that's about? Living, living in the Village is a, is a play off of the African-American, uh, of the African proverb of it takes a, a village to raise a child, uh -huh. but I wanted to take it a step further because that almost it, it negates the, the need for personal responsibility. Yeah. So as the need for, as stronger children are created by stronger villages, the villages is strengthened by individuals becoming stronger. Mm -hmm. So we have to look at if I do something for the benefit of myself as well as building myself up, but not for the benefit of myself, but for the benefit of my entire community, then everybody benefits. And that's what, and it's a financial literacy book, okay. uh, you know, based off of adages uh, like Madam C.J. Walker, who said that when they asked her, why does she want to become the first African-American -Amer African millionaire? She said, well, the more money that I made, the more people I can help. Mm -hmm. Because uh, at the end of the day, it's all about, you know, the biggest blessings come from what you can do for other people, not for what you can do for yourself. Huh. But it's real hard to be a blessing to other people if you're going through foreclosure. Or if your credit, if a collections agency is calling you every mm -hmm. other day, so these type of obstacles, if you, if we can uh, use financial literacy to negate uh, the the obstacles of, of of money and move these obstacles out of the way, then we can begin to empower ourselves. So that's the majority of the book. Then about it's eighty percent of it, about twenty percent of it are 15 testimonies of individuals from all walks of life, from, from gang members to multi-million dollar real estate developers, to entrepreneurs, to mm -hmm. teachers, to parents, to spouses, to inner city youth, all who have used principles of fiscal responsibility to overcome adversity in life. And now, uh, because they've been able to do so, are giving back to society. And I guess one example would be a, a Damon Jenkins, who was a gang member, and we helped him to form a business when he came from home from Rikers Island. And now today he uses this construction company that we helped him to form to help other members of the Bloods and former members to help their companies right. to grow and expand. So these are the types of stories that I feel that we have to get ourselves to. To share with the people so they can know, because everybody is not... Um, falling down, but some people are actually doing some positive things. Exactly. It's not, I mean, it's not all bleak. It's a lot of things mm -hmm. out there. A lot of folks living check to some check and struggling, but it's yeah. a lot of, it's a lot of positive things happening mm -hmm. in this, in this Now, community. when you talk about the uh, principles of financial yeah. literacy, what exactly are some of those principles that well, you're referring to? Well, we go into everything from how to improve your credit, seven okay. steps to how to improve your credit, and mm -hmm. a multitude of things and real tangible steps mm -hmm. of even letters that you can write to help dispute various okay. things, how to eliminate debt, how to open up bank accounts, the right type of accounts to open up, how mm -hmm. to put money into emergency funds, how much money you should put into emergency funds, yeah. how to prepare for your estate, how to maximize your insurance plan, how to make mm -hmm. sure that you're avoiding excessive consumption, how to make sure that you are uh, giving back in the most effective way, how to invest in stocks and bonds and in mm -hmm. real estate, how to purchase your first home, okay. buying versus leasing a car, how to, uh, the types of uh, the professionals that you should have to build and, and the type of professionals that can help you professionally. So it, it's a multitude of things. It goes over the seven steps of financial freedom. Again, but we ended off with how to use all these principles and then take it and give back to your community and make sure you're giving back most effectively. So it's really a comprehensive book in a step-by-step -step book yeah. that I, I tried as a financial advisor to make sure that I wrote it in a way that if people were to come to me and I give them step-by-step -step process, mm -hmm. they were able to read it as if I was actually assisting them through Speaking to them. the process in a step-by-step -step format. And so it sounds like it's in pretty good layman's terms yeah. where just whoever picks up the book can just read it and 
if they're motivated by it, and I'm sure they would be, yeah. able to just go and get into and how to make these steps. What are some of the things in order to improve the credit? Like you said, write the letters. What are some of the other things? Well, we have the, the, we have various things, steps of, you know, we really break down in the book what the Fair Isaac Corporation looks okay. at to determine credit. And the Fair Isaac is the, the FICO score. It's, it's the FICO score, yes. Mm -hmm. So these are individuals that determine that three-digit number that dictates whether or not you're going to get, uh, what type of rates you'll get on your insurance, mm -hmm. whether or not you'll be able to get a job whether or not you'll be able exactly. to rent a piece of property, whether or not you'll be able to purchase homes. Mm -hmm. All these things are determined by that three-digit number. And as you know, and as you know in, in this post-recession environment, uh, it's 25% of, of all this country has a FICO score of 600 or lower. Wow. Whereas before, pre-recession, -pre it was about 17%. So mm -hmm. we, a lot of individuals are now struggling getting through this credit crunch. And now, you know, banks are becoming a lot more stingy. But then individuals are not able to have it because a lot of their credit scores have suffered. So we really have to start doing things like paying our bills on time, 35% yeah. of your FICO scores paying your bills on time. 30% of your FICO score is your balance and how much you owe compared to your lending limit ratio. 15% mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, is your length of credit history. 10% yeah. is essentially, uh, you know, so as we're paying down debt that is assisted, your length of credit history. You know, a lot of these things out here, uh, we do a lot of advocacy against things like uh, the rush card, the uh, yeah. renter centers. These things that prey on individuals with low or no credit mm -hmm. who are deemed to be unbankable. Uh, and what I call it is I call it evidence of ignorance where they go around and they see cases where a lot of individuals are not doing these things that are necessary to build their credit. So then they introduce products to capitalize off of that, i.e. prepaid debit card to say, hey. Let me just deem you to be unbankable, and then I'm going to give you this rush card and make you pay to use your own money, which is a financial predator and a totally waste, wasteful product uh, that we don't have to use if we are educated about how to use the right proper credit and right mm -hmm. things in our mm -hmm. communities. Yeah. Now, one thing you said that was interesting, one of the, the young men you helped was a former inmate, incarcerated yeah. young man. And I know most of the time, if you have any kind of record, it's difficult, I yeah. guess, to start establishing a business or a credit or anything like that. Yeah. So where, how did you help this guy do that? Because well, essentially, I mean, we, what we tell a lot of folks, we do, we have, in our not-for-profit, we have a lot of uh, programs, and we well, we deal with a lot of individuals who are formerly incarcerated. And mm -hmm. my whole strategy with them is sometimes if individuals cause you to check that box that says felon, mm -hmm. then you can just maybe create your own job, create mm -hmm. your own opportunity. Yeah. To sometimes. I mean, this is, I mean, but he, this uh, young man was very good with his hands. He was good with construction. Okay. We used the local resources right with our mm -hmm. own backyard. We went down to a not for profit. He got his electrician's license, mm -hmm. went to uh, Ink It Now. I mean, they don't look to see what your record is to form an LLC. Mm -hmm. So we formed this company. I, I looked, he had like about $300 in his pocket. And at $300, we formed an LLC. We got the EIN number. We went to irs.gov, uh, walked down to the ba bank, opened up a bank account, okay. uh, took the remaining dollars of that after we paid the fees for the LLC and the business formation to essentially then get flyers and things to start letting individuals know that his company TSD Construction was open for business and so we helped to push and let him know that he was available to do construction, to be an electrician and to really just start driving individuals to his business but again all those things I mean it it, I, I, to my knowledge, the, the, the process of that he was pre formerly incarcerated never came up. Never it was, even was an issue. It was never right. an issue because he created his own opportunity. And he says yeah. to me, you know, thank you for helping me. I said, man, look, I didn't really do a lot. You were the one that came to us and you were the one that had your mind open and available mm -hmm. for guidance because no one does anything on their own. That's I've, true. I've, I've done a lot of stuff, but I've not done a lot of stuff on my own. Mm -hmm. I've, I've gotten assistance, but I've always been open and available to assistance. So I think that uh, the problem of formerly incarcerated isn't necessarily about waiting on your ship to come in. It's learning how to swim out to the ship. And I think yeah. that to a formerly incarcerated brothers and sisters are going to learn start doing. And once we do that, it can be an economic revolution in that society as well. And it brings up another point because not only... Uh, for someone who was incarcerated, but just with the economy and unemployment being yeah. as high as it is, brothers and sisters now truly have to learn how to become independent. One yeah. of the things we talked about <clears throat> in my workshop is that you have to understand if there are, just as you said, the man was good with his hands, mm -hmm. if there are any uh, special skills or abilities or gifts that you have, right. try to parlay that into uh, income producing activity. Exactly. And I mean, as you said, to go ahead and, and make it one step even further mm -hmm. to go ahead and to uh, establish yourself as a authentic business, yeah. a bona fide business Above where you board. can do all of that. 
then it helps you even more mm -hmm. because now you can get money and access leverage money from different organizations. And you know, a lot of these folks, they try to feel that they're getting out uh, over by staying outside of the system. Right. Um, and but there is money in the system. Mm -hmm. And again, this mm -hmm. capitalism system, there's money in it. There's money in being able to the, get access to those 300 additional tax uh, discounts that you have by owning an LLC. Exactly. So these are the types of things that we like to teach in entrepreneurship courses from even just mm -hmm. basic things in terms of what is your passion and purpose in life. And again, I like to use the example of the gang members, the examples of formerly incarcerated, and individuals say, well, what does that have to do with me? Uh, you know, I've never been to prison. Well, my analogy is, I mean, if you've never been to prison, then you haven't had as tough an obstacle exactly. as he may have had. So you need to look at those individuals mm -hmm. going through these, mm -hmm. these, these valleys in order to reach these mountaintops that we've seen in our society as right. examples of, you know, because many individuals, and Ali Velshi wrote the foreword, and he said it very poignantly. He said, many of us in society, and, I, and the real unemployment rate is about 16.1%. And that includes not only those who are unemployed, those who are no longer look for jobs, who fell out of the system. Um, so we, uh, individuals who are trying to find employment, you know, we just have to make sure that they're motivated and, and to do those things, that to think outside of the box where the money really exists, mm -hmm. to do some things to get back into the system who haven't had felonies, who haven't had to be uh, victimized by substance abuse problems, who haven't gone through these types of obstacles that maybe like these former gang members have, to really rebound and get back on track. Again, you're listening to HarlemTalkRadio.com. This is Faith Finance and You. I'm Reverend Charles Butler, and today we're talking to uh, Mr. Ryan Mack, president of Optimum Capital Management. And we're talking about his new book, Living in the Village, but also with Mr. Mack's background, we wanted to know about just what's going on now in the investment world. What kind of things are going on? Well, we have a, um, a very difficult market market to judge yeah. right now. Um, well, the market's actually doing really well. Uh, mm -hmm. I've actually felt that it might be a little bit premature in terms of its rally. We now, I mean, you know, uh, right post recession or in the middle of recession, we saw the Dow Jones at about sixty five, sixty six hundred. Mm -hmm. Now it's about almost almost double that, right around right. twelve thousand two hundred. But um, I do feel that there's a lot of things. We still have unemployment. We still have a high degree of uh, credit crunch. Individuals or banks are not necessarily lending. Businesses is about two trillion dollars in business capital on the sidelines because mm -hmm. businesses are afraid to invest and put people back to work. What you're seeing now. Uh, a lot of businesses are doing things such as increasing their uh, 401k match programs, uh, making sure that they might be able to give individuals a 5% pay raise or okay. uh, as and, and increasing their productivity levels as opposed to hiring somebody else. So we're still seeing that in employment. Because I've always felt that African Americans have always generated a lot, you know, a style, yeah. a lot of initiatives, a lot of trends, but we never take it that extra step right. to well, let me change this and, and transform this idea into a business, a right. business model. And there are models available. There are now a lot of uh, programs available, as you were saying, mm -hmm. to help people get off the ground and start the business. And the fact is that with employers not really hiring as much right now. And there mm -hmm. was a time when, uh, for example, if you were a single parent or a veteran or a handicap or a minority even, that gave you a little uh, advantage in the job market. But those days are even gone now yeah. to the extent that right now I call it almost uh, musical chairs where there's just more people than employment seats available. Right. And unless you come up with some kind of idea mm -hmm. to create your own income, you may be left standing when the right. music stops. I mean, this is the thing. When we, I've seen businesses that have been created, that have been phenomenal. I saw one young lady that we assisted. She started a business, became a pet sitting. She had a, a, a nice size apartment, couldn't mm -hmm. really afford it all. And she turned her apartment into a huge pet sitting uh, mm. apartment. So she started it, to, it basically sat, she pet sits Services. for a variety of pet sitters mm -hmm. of, of different types of pets. And that uh, she was able to quit her uh, full-time job and that became her that became her full-time job yeah. you know a lot, a lot of folks another one we assisted is she, she's a dog walker mm -hmm. you know she realized that it's really cold and then she just recently started a business and over the past few months with a lot of extreme temperatures folks don't want to walk their dogs now mm -hmm. so she started a dog walking business had a good network of individuals she knew a lot of folks so she started to walk mm -hmm. individuals dogs and that became a pretty successful part-time job that she does in the evenings mm -hmm. when she gets off of, off of work we mm -hmm. see for bookkeeping we saw one individual who was very adept at keeping books and he realized he was a very uh, in terms of just numbers and keeping everything in precise order so he started his own bookkeeping business and helped individuals and companies to go down mm -hmm. and 
help them organize their books. And he does that as a part-time job. My aunt, actually, she saved her home for foreclosure because when she lost her job, mm -hmm. she eventually, she knew she knew how to make jewelry. She did it as a hobby and does it all, every evening when she got off of work. But she lost her job. She was worried about losing her home. So she took all this jewelry that she had and she started going into the local schools and started to sell it. So she was able to generate enough capital to at yeah, least keep herself that? above float right. to, above water to, by selling jewelry within the schools with all these teachers. So these mm -hmm. are the types of things that we have to start doing. I mean, starting a business, you want, not every business is going to become the next million dollar firm, right. but there are ways in order to at least create an additional streams of income, income exactly. to, to keep yourself above float that I encourage individuals they should start doing right now what are your skills what are your passions to start mm -hmm. getting into those mm -hmm. things immediately and it's important if you are working to start doing that so you can kind of use this time as an mm -hmm. incubator as you say your aunt uh, just doing it out of a hobby a lot of times that's what stuff will start off as a hobby or just a little skill you have and then you're able to move it I try to tell the home buyers that because a lot of times they get into that mortgage mm -hmm. additional money that are to golden shackles yeah <laughs> exactly. that's that mortgage boy once you get that mortgage there's no leaving mm -hmm. and i'll also employ individuals uh and, and, and what i would say is that if you have if you have a dream of starting a business uh and you want to buy a home I always say start the business first at least mm -hmm. get that going. And then once that's going and then you can cover the mortgage, then purchase a piece of property. I've seen a lot of individuals try to reverse the process. Mm -hmm. And what happens is you get in that piece of property and then that business goes by the wayside because they're so concerned about that mortgage. So let's just start just try to be very methodical about all the investments, businesses, stocks, bonds, real estate, all these type of things are investments. And then just have a solid strategy no matter what you go into or what you choose to pursue. Yeah. All right. You're listening to HarlemTalkRadio.com. I'm uh, Reverend Charles Butler, and this is Faith Finance and You, and we're talking today with Mr. Ryan Mack. He's giving us a lot of great information on what we can be doing as a community around starting businesses, investing, uh, improving our credit, and some other things. So we're going to just continue with the conversation. I want to get back to the book, if I can, mm -hmm. uh, Ryan. Uh, now, this came out of, I guess, a passion that you had. And we're yeah. talking about people with passion and stuff. So this is a thing you had uh, to share and to give back in the community. How did yeah. you really get this thing moving here? In the, in I've been doing this. I've been teaching financial literacy uh, going on about seven years. Okay. And we've been averaging maybe four to six workshops every month, somewhere. Mm -hmm. And... What I started to see, because on you know some weeks we'll be in California, work with MS-13s. Other mm -hmm. weeks we flew to South Africa. One other weeks we'll be in Detroit in the prison. Sometimes mm -hmm. we'll do workshops with uh, where I used to be a stock trader on Wall Street. We'll work with those who are on Wall Street, maximizing their 401k and uh, helping them diversify their portfolio. So we've been teaching a broad demographic of individuals, and so. Mm -hmm. I started to realize that any, no matter what your class, race, or income level, or you, many individuals have the same problems and just learning how to manage your money. They need inspiration. So we developed a workshop, uh, and I called it Living in the Village, because I realized that as we live in this village or community, there are certain things that we have to start to do to not only understand that what we impact on ourselves impacts others. You know, Martin Luther King said it. He said that what, uh, you know, what impacts me directly impacts all of us indirectly. That's and I right. cannot be all that I ought to be until that you are all you ought to be. And this is the interrelatable structure of reality. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have to stop looking at things selfishly, And which was, was caused in 2007 when the two most powerful forces in the universe uh, are self love and selfishness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as individuals in 2007 were thinking only from their own perspectives. The government was thinking about how can I save my seat, mm -hmm. you know, and, and be reelected. So I'm going to take this lobbyist of special interest money and not worry about regulation. Corporations were saying, well, I think I need to be concerned about making the most money regardless of being, being responsible or not. And people were taking mortgages and selling them off somewhere else and just releasing all the mortgages possible. And individuals, to a certain extent, and many individuals going out with 500 FICO scores with no money in the bank yeah. saying, I still think I can buy a home. Well, that's selfish. So we have to turn that around and think and think about with love and say, what can we do to make sure our own, you know, and I see a lot of situations and, you know, we've done about maybe 80 workshops in public housing communities over the past year or so, you know, 
And, you know, a lot of the decisions that we individuals have made, even with the least amount of income, you know, because I'm, I'm a huge advocate of working with those who are in poverty because I have a lot of history with my own family background okay. and subsidized living. So uh, I've seen what my mother did in order to get us out of that type of situation, using love to pull herself out of that situation. So, um, you know, it's not love if you have children and have rims on your car, but no money in the 529. Right. College savings account. That's not love. It's not love if you have this great, tremendous idea and you're spending all your time in the club and you're spending, mm-hmm. wasting time spending, you know, as opposed to taking this idea and turning it into a business so you can be successful. And that idea may employ five or six other individuals in your right. community. This is not love. So I wanted to write a book that really addressed the issue of what love is and what financial literacy really is and what it really does, not only for yourself, but for the community as a whole. Mm-hmm. And that's such a great point because. Uh, uh, one of the reasons we even started this program mm. was about from a community perspective right. and how the community has continued to be fragmented, how the com- community has continued to uh, suffer in mm. so many different areas. You know, uh, again, lack of affordable housing. Mm. We just can't come together as a community. So when, when I hear someone saying, you know, it's about let's trying to love each other, which is what Jesus was talking about, love your neighbor as yourself, yeah. you know. And uh, that we need to come together and put aside some of the differences and put aside a lot of the selfishness Mm -hmm. that we see going on in here and not being trying to rip each other off and take advantage of each other, but come to a conclusion or consensus that we're all in, we're all a one, uh, one nation. We're all a one generation. We all are really here together and we should be striving as a community. I think if we could get our forces together, Mm -hmm. we could then really start to make a difference. Okay, so Ryan, give us a few tips on how uh, an individual can restore their credit. Well, first thing, we have to establish a length of credit history. Mm -hmm. Um, I always advocate, again, with with these prepaid prepaid debit cards, a lot of those are preying on individuals, saying that they are deemed to be unbankable. Uh, I don't think they are unbankable. First of all, there's a huge movement out there uh, called the Bank On uh, Initiative. Mm -hmm. There was an initiative right here. A lot of these banks that previously deemed individuals to be unbankable are now trying to service individuals who uh, might not necessarily have the credit in order to open up a traditional bank account. So I would look into that. Uh, I don't know the website offhand, but if you just mm-hmm. Google Bank On, you'll be able to find some different banks within your area that will be able to help you establish, or uh, at least establish and open up a bank account. Uh, you might not be able to have access to overdrafting or at least opt into overdrafting. You might not be able to write checks, but at least you'll be able to at least have a bank account and mm-hmm. be banked somewhere. Uh, definitely look at those banks that do not have uh, uh, fees attached to them. Uh, if you do have a bank, you want to get a secured credit credit card, if you don't have access to this card right now, a secured credit card assists you by, essentially a secured credit card is, is if you put up three, five hundred dollars in collateral, the bank holds that as collateral and they, they secure it, you secure that loan and now you use that card as a regular uh, credit card mm-hmm. in which when you go and you pay uh, things for your grocery bill or various everyday bills, you can pay that off and that helps you establish line of credit. The knock on rest card and other prepaid debit cards is they don't have any mm-hmm. any ties to any line of credit. So as you're using the rest card, your, your credit, your FICO score is not improving because that's the same thing as using cash, but you're paying a penalty and fees just for using your own cash. A lot of different credit unions out there have loan builder programs. I know the People's Alliance here in New York, uh, the People's Alliance Federal Credit Union has a great program where they can help you establish credit history where, uh, again, you can just check out your local branches. You go in there, you may borrow $1,000, but you don't get the $1,000. They take the $1,000 and they store it in an interest-bearing account, and you start paying off the loan as if you had an actual loan. So what this does is it gives you a what is equivalent to a secured loan. The difference between a secured loan and unsecured loan, secured loans have a higher weighting on your credit. So if you buy a car, $5,000 in the car or a mortgage means more to restoring your credit as $5,000 dollars in the credit card. So by paying off that five thousand dollars, you start to establish a credit loan or that one thousand dollars is it counts as a secure loan and helps you establish credit history. Paying your bills on time, making sure you're an automatic bill payment, paying down your debts, going to annualcreditreport.com and disputing anything that you feel is not accurate. There's a lot of our case of identity theft out there. Again, annualcreditreport.com. I've gotten 
a lot of folks to improve their FICO scores tremendously just by disputing claims on that. Uh, and so a lot of different things, again, making sure that you don't apply for different uh, bank cards frivolously. Again, you uh, individuals, as soon as you fill out that application, 10% of your FICO score is additional credit inquiry. So mm -hmm. you fill it out, that's five to six points off just because they have to check your background right, right. to see if they got that. So if you want to go look at bankrate.com, research the right credit card to use and make sure that when you f fill out a credit card, it's the right one for you with no fees, decent interest rate. Great. Great, good points. A lot of good information. Uh, again, this is HarlemTalkRadio.com. I'm Reverend Charles Butler. This is Faith Finance and You, the talk show for the community. Uh, Ryan, as Ryan Mack is our host, is our guest this week, I should say, and I want to ask you again to just put up to tell everybody about your websites, how they can contact you, uh, if they want to order the book. Living in the village, what kind of things that you have for that? Yeah, eight seven seven seventy five teach. That's eight seven 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 five eight three two two four is our number. Please give us a call. We are very accessible. Optimum Capital, Minella King, Faith, Kareem Herzog, Christina Hodges, and a whole host of volunteers that assist us on our day to day operations. Uh, livinginthevillage.com www.livinginthevillage.com to find out information on the book it's also available at Barnes and Nobles Borders Amazon.com and all those different sites uh, all about biz.org if you are youth or know of youth of high school college and graduate school who is in school want to learn about financial literacy and then moneymovement.org if you are a urban young urban professional wanting to get active and not only learn about financial literacy we urge you to go there take the pledge become fiscally responsible and then look at the 10 tenets and say that I will abide by these 10 tenets. It's free. All it is is it requires you to, we just want your word that you're going to be fiscally responsible and contribute to this money movement that we're creating. All right. Again, I want to thank you for thank taking you. the time out of your schedule. You're a very busy man and very uh, doing some really great work here in the community, not only in Harlem, but throughout New York City. I know you're going to be down at one of the banks tomorrow night doing a yeah. financial literacy program. you got your youth doing stuff. I'm just excited that you were able to come on and be a part I'm of the show. I'm humbled to do so. I'm really humbled to do I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, thank you again very much. This is HarlemTalkRadio.com. I'm Reverend Charles Butler, and you've been listening to Faith, Finance, and You. Please join us again next week. Thank you very much. I don't know what you're not doing, but what you should be doing is logging on to HarlemTalkRadio.com and checking out Faith, Finance, and You with Reverend Charles Butler. It's the best time that you'll ever invest today, I promise you.